there, AP Environmental Science class. We're going to move on now to Chapter 8, The Human Population. And I thought it would be uh, powerful to start this lecture with this website right here, which is a live count of the current world population. If you want to check it out yourself, you'll notice it up here, worldometers.info. Uh, this is basically showing us uh, live uh, how many people are being born today, are dying today, and, and therefore the population growth not only today, uh, but this calendar year. And then you'll notice there the total world population, just over 7.8 billion people and climbing. All right. Uh, this is live as of Wednesday. Wednesday, the 18th of, of November. So most of you are probably seeing this about a week later. So obviously these numbers are even higher now than they were uh, when I when I taped this uh, this uh, lecture for you guys. And I think that's the main point of this chapter, chapter eight on the human population. Our population is booming on this planet. And unfortunately, uh, our uh, carrying capacity on this planet uh, is being reached. And we're seeing a lot of our natural capital degraded uh, because of all the humans uh, that are now populated populating this planet. So this is what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Why are we seeing such a uh, population boom uh, these days? And what things can we do to maybe uh, stop this uh, incredible growth of population as again, 7.8 billion and climbing as we speak on the planet. All right, so let's get to it. Here we go. Chapter eight, the human population. Uh, once again, so I'll split this up into two lectures. There's about 51 slides or so. So here we go. From the evolution of Homo sapiens to a total population of 2 billion took about 200,000 years. Then it took less than 50 years to add another 2 billion people. Then it took 25 years to add a third 2 billion people. Then it said 18 years later, the Earth had 7.5 billion, but this was done about two years ago. So you're now here, uh, we could say 20 years later, we're at 7.8 billion people and climbing. And that's the key here, guys. This is what we're talking about, how early on in our history, our, our population didn't really grow that much. It's been in the last uh, couple of hundred years that we've seen this population increase. And we'll talk about why that's the case. And then we'll talk about, the, obviously, some issues that are arising uh, because of that. Here are some factors that are impacting our rapid rise of human population. We have the emergence of agricultural increased food production, all right, uh, basically agriculture out there making enough food to support people. Technologies help humans expand into almost all the planet's climates and habitats. Think about this. Just a couple of hundred years ago, we didn't have air conditioning and heat, right? And now we have that. We have people, scientists living out at the South Pole as we speak right now, okay? So you can see how technology has helped us expand into all these habitats, and that has helped allow our population to increase as dramatically as it is. Uh, we'll talk about how technology is going to be needed to increase the carrying capacity uh, of Earth for humans uh, because if we don't increase that carrying capacity, uh, we could be in, in, in big trouble uh, down the road. Also, we had a drop in death rates with improved sanitation and health care uh, over the past 100, 150 years. So what is a sustainable human population? That's going to be the big question that we're going to try to answer. So how many people can the Earth support throughout most of history? Again, population rose slowly. But the past 200 years, it has grown rapidly with China, India, and the United States, the top three countries in terms of population, but not necessarily in the terms of population growth currently. And again, we'll talk about that more as we go through this lecture. So uh, here is human population growth. The rate of population growth has slowed since 1960 to about 1.2%. But obviously, 1.2% means that the world's population is still growing. But it's not not growing evenly. It's unevenly distributed geographically. So of that world's population that we're adding, you know, numbers just before I showed you on that live website, of those numbers, 2% of the population being added are coming from more developed countries like the US, like those countries in the European Union, while 98% of those of those of that population being added is coming from less developed countries like India, uh, like much, much, much of Africa. All right, and this is what we will talk about. We'll talk about why that's the case, and we'll talk about some uh, some some mitigating factors that we can do to maybe help our less developed countries uh, slow down their 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 population population growth. In addition, people are moving from rural to urban areas, okay, and that is changing the population growth as well. So you'll notice here uh, is the uh, graph here, this graph 
right here is your population growth rate. And you'll notice that the population growth rate is coming down. So the red and blue or where this meets here is kind of currently. All right. So our population, uh, our population growth rate is decreasing. However, our population size continues to increase. So even though the growth rate is decreasing because we have more people on the planet, uh, it's still leading to a population increase. And again, by 2050, uh, we could be approaching 10 billion people on this planet. All right. And again, that is going to lead to some problems. But Here's a graph showing, once again, that most of the population increase is coming from those less developed countries. Again, in the more developed countries, we'll talk about this in a bit, a lot of the more developed countries actually aren't seeing a population increase. So where is the uh, all these people being added from? It's coming from these less developed countries. Uh, and again, we'll talk about why coming up. So how long can the human population keep growing? We have many differing views on this. Again, we've already exceeded typically points or, or planetary boundaries. The main problem is the rapidly growing number of people in those less developed countries. Over, overcompensation in more developed countries is a problem. So what's happening is in the more developed countries, we're over consuming more than our population. And then in the less developed countries, they're not over consuming, they're just producing more people. Uh, tech and technological ingenuity will help find substitutes to resources we are depleting. That's what I was saying before. We're going to need our technology to try to increase the carrying capacity uh, when it comes to humans of planet Earth. If we don't increase that carrying capacity, then we could be seeing a population crash, and that means lots of folks are going to die. We obviously don't want to see that. So we're going to have to use our brains and use our technologies to try to increase that carrying capacity so that the Earth can support more people. Because again, as I just showed you uh, on that counter, as we speak, uh, the population of planet Earth continues to increase. So uh, proponents for, of slowing population growth say that the basic need for 1 billion people are already not being met. Death rates could increase significantly and a population crash could result. Again, just what I said before, because again, we're not, we're, we're, we're above our, 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 our carrying capacity right now on planet Earth. The amount of people, we're above it. Uh, basic needs for a while, about 1 billion of those 7.8 billion not being met. Okay, so we need to somehow technologically either bring up our carrying capacity or at least try to hold our population growth because again if we don't do that death rates could increase significantly as china india and brazil increase their ecological footprints greater resource use and environmental degradation may result again a lot of these uh, less developed countries are just starting to get uh, be become developed uh, so they're just starting to use all their natural resources uh, so we haven't even talked about uh uh, Brazil, for instance, uh, cutting down forests in, in, in the Amazon, uh, you know, they're doing that to help uh, plant, have areas to plant crops for their people to make money so that they can not move out of becoming a, a developing nation. So here's kind of where we uh, kind of have this yin and the yang. Do we, we want people to not to become developed, but in order to do that, resources need to be used. And where do we find that balancing act uh, to keep everything, uh, everything in track? So as human population grows, so does the global human ecological footprint. Again, the more people, the more resources we are consuming. Uh, and again, we talk about this cultural carrying capacity. I've kind of been mentioning this. This is the maximum number of people who could, who could live in reasonable freedom and comfort indefinitely without decreasing the ability of the earth to sustain future generations. So that's the definition of cultural carrying capacity. And again, that's what we're trying to we're trying to increase on Earth uh, with the use of our technology because of the fact that our population continues to grow. So here is a chart that shows some of the natural capital degradation that is occurring uh, because we are altering nature to meet the needs of uh, 7.8 billion people and climbing. Uh, we're reducing biodiversity. We're increasing uh, uh, increasing the use of that net primary productivity. All right, so we're, we're increasing the use of it so there's not as much around for nature to use, right? We're increasing genetic resistance in pest species and disease 
disease causing bacteria. What does that mean? Well, we're basically, uh, because we're using pesticides, pest species are basically becoming genetically resistant to these pesticides and they're continuing to overrun us. Uh, the same thing with disease uh, causing bacteria. We're eliminating many natural predators, which of course uh, disrupt the food chain and those trophic levels we talked about in previous chapters. We're introducing harmful species into na uh, natural uh, communities there, all right? And again, this is your, your, your invasive species, all right? And we're going to talk about that more, I believe, in Chapter 9 coming up, all right? But these harmful species into natural communities, uh, obviously ruining the communities there. Using some renewable resources faster than they, that, than, than they can be replenished. We talked about that on uh, disrupting natural chemical cycling and energy flow and, of course, relying mostly on polluting and climate-changing fossil fuels. Uh, again, all these reasons uh, that we are degrading our our natural capital. So what factors influence the size of the human population? Well, population is going to increase through births and immigration. Population is going to decrease through deaths and emigration. So immigration is moving in, emigration is moving out, okay? Key factors that determine population size, the average number of children born to women in a population. So this would be called the total fertility rate, all right? The total fertility rate is the average number of children born to women in a population. So here are just some uh, formulas. And again, this is hopefully uh, pretty self-intuitive here. Population change is going to equal your births and your immigration, right? Those are people coming in, either by being born or moving in, minus your deaths plus emigration. So people who die or people who leave, that's going to equal your population change. Now, the crude birth rate, uh, again, a term is the number of live births per 1,000 people in a population per year, while the crude death rate is the number of deaths per 1,000 people in a population per year. Okay, so these are just some terms uh, that you should be aware of. And again, that population change births plus immigration minus deaths plus emigration, again, hopefully uh, is, is pretty self-intuitive there, all right? Something called the replacement level fertility rate. Now, this is the average number of children a couple must bear to replace themselves. Now, it's approximately 2.1. You say to yourself, why isn't it 2? right? If, if me and my wife need to replace me and my wife when we die, you would think we would need to have two children that would equally replace us. However, it needs to be 2.1 because unfortunately some children will die before reaching their reproductive years. So we need to have that replacement level fertility rate to be just over 2, 2.1, all right? Uh, and that would allow that there would, if you had 2.1, you actually wouldn't have any population growth. It would be steady, okay, because you would be having just as many children as would replace you when you die, all right? So that would keep the population steady. So anything under 2.1 of a replacement level fertility rate would cause the population to decrease. Anything above 2.1 is going to uh, cause the population to increase. Now, the total fertility rate, the TFR, is the average number of children born to women of childbearing age in the entire population, okay? So between 1955 and 2012, the global TFR dropped from 5% to 2.5%. To eventually halt population growth, once I said, the global TFR must drop to the fertility replacement level of 2.1, okay? Uh, and again, it's not percent. I apologize. That's not percent. Uh, it's the amount of people. So it dropped from 5 to 2.5, all right? That's just the average number of children. So again, I apologize. Not a percent. Just the average number of children born to women of childbearing age. Between uh, 1955 to 2012, it went from 5 down to 2.5. But again, it needs to be below 2.1 if we're going to decrease our population. It needs to be at 2.1, which is, uh, which again, uh, is, that, is that fertility replacement level to keep the population steady. Okay, so when we look at fertility rates, this is the United States, okay, from just uh, shy of 1920 uh, to basically where we are now. And what you'll notice is from the 1920s uh, into the 30s here, we are, were births per women were over three. So our population was really increasing. Then we went down uh, into the war years here, okay, into the 40s. And we got, unfortunately, the men were overseas fighting World War II. Uh, and we kind of went close. This line here is that 2.1, okay, that makes the population stay, stay steady. 
Then we had our baby boom, right? Everyone came home from the war and uh, a lot of people got married and got together. And obviously we had a huge increase in population. Uh, these are, this is my parents, so it would be your grandparents, I believe. Um, here in the in the mid 40s to the mid 60s were born. You can see that that population, that birth per women or fertility rate uh, was approaching 3.5 again. And then in the 70s, it kind of dropped off dramatically. And now we've been kind of steady right around 2, 2.1 here in the U.S. So our population uh, is actually holding steady or maybe dropping just a tad uh, because our fertility rate, again, is around that replacement level rate of 2.1, which keeps your population steady. And if anything, maybe we're slightly below that these days. Uh, so if anything, maybe our, our population in the U.S. is slightly decreasing. But again, this is not the case in other parts of the world, especially in our, our, our non-developed countries they're still seeing three, four, five births uh, per women per year, and that's what's causing uh, the population of this planet to increase. So projecting population change, human population size in 2015 is estimated to be between 7.8 billion, well, it ain't going to be 7.8 billion, we're already there, and 10.8 billion. So it looks like we're going to be closer closer to that, to that 10 billion people uh, in about 30 years or so. And again, factors influencing the range of estimates. So again, the estimates is, is you know three billion people that's kind of a kind of a large range there uh, basically the reliability of current population estimates assumptions about trends in in infertility obviously those trends could change uh, and different organizations who estimate populations use different methods and data uh, that could also cause uh, that large range but uh, here is again just some uh, just some world population in, bil in billions. Uh, and these are just different models that are run. So here's the low fertility variant. Uh, here's the medium fertility variant, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you can kind of see, I would say the green one isn't, isn't true because we're already kind of there. Uh, where are we? 2020 here. So uh, we're already kind of there. So we're really probably going to be more of these uh, high fertility variant uh, potential uh, model would be the one that that may be the answer. But you can see, again, these are why we have such a big range there uh, because of these different models. But again, I think we're going to be skewed higher. So I would look at the, uh, the, the red model, the UN high fertility variant and the U.S. Census Bureau uh, model as more indicative of where we're going to be uh, by 2050. All right, so case study, the U.S. population, third largest and growing, uh, but again, maybe not growing as fast if you look at those uh, those uh, fertility rates that I showed you in, in the previous chart. Uh, 76 million in 1900, 322 million in 2015. All right, this again is, is here in the United States. A uh, drop, though, in TFR in the United States, our total fertility rate has dropped, and as a result, the rate of population growth has slowed here in the U.S., 40% of the total U.S. population increase in 2015 came from legal immigration. So think about that. Again, immigration is part of that total population formula and 40% of our increase coming from legal immigration. China surpassed Mexico as the largest source of new immigrants uh, into our country um, in, 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 in 2015. So uh, you can see that while our population is growing, a lot of it now has to do uh, with immigration and not necessarily births because, again, our TFR total fertility rate has dropped here uh, in the United States. So, again, uh, here are just some uh, uh, immigrants. We're talking about legal immigrants here. You'll notice uh, 1907, 1914, big, big, uh, you know, climb of the immigrants coming into the country, then it dropped during the Great Depression, then it peaked again in uh, in the in the 90s, it looked like, and now it kind of dropped and maybe is, is uh, leveling off a little bit. So just understand that uh, immigration can obviously add to population of an area as well. Uh, and again, here's just some uh, more information concerning uh, here, here in the U.S., all right, between 1900 and 2000. So you'll notice the uh, life expectancy was 47 years in 1900, 77 years in 2000. Obviously, that's a reason for population growth. Uh, married women working outside the home has increased. So that is actually why our TFR has decreased. We're going to talk about that, I think, in the second lecture uh, of this chapter. But uh, empowering women to go to work and to have something else to do in their lives other than give birth uh, helps decrease your total for 
fertility rate and obviously slows down your population growth. And you can see that. Look at that. 8% in 1900 working outside the home. 81% of married women working outside the home in 2000. High school graduates, uh, many more were more educated. That's another way to, to decrease uh, population growth is to educate, educate your population. Uh, you'll notice homes with flush toilets. That helps uh, sanitation. So that helps people live as well. Look at that. 10% in 1900. That's it. Now almost 100%, right? Homes with electricity, right? Almost 100% in 1900. Mostly, in, barely anyone had, had, had electricity in their house. Uh, living in suburbs uh, has increased. Hourly manufacturing job wage has increased. And homicides per year, oh, unfortunately, also has has increased. Uh, so not exactly sure how that fits in with all of this, uh, but it's definitely an in, uh, interesting uh, statistic to look at. All right, so more factors that affect the birth and fertility rates, importance of children as part of the labor force. So this is why in less developed countries, another reason uh, why they have a lot of children. They need children to help in the labor force. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're poor in a developed country, in a, in a, in a non-developed country, uh, I'm going to send your child to work maybe at 10, 11, 12 years old because you need money. Uh, the cost of raising and educating children is very high, so that can actually uh, decrease uh, uh, of the population. Availability of pension systems. If you have a pension system, then people send, tend to live longer, all right? And that obviously is going to affect your population. Urbanization affects birth and, and, and fertility rates. And again, education and employment opportunities for women. The more education, educate and the more employment opportunities women have, the, the, your TFR, your total fertility rate will go down because, again, women have other things to think about uh, instead of having children. So it's, it's important, especially in these underdeveloped countries, that we educate the women there and we give the women, uh, uh, I don't want to say a way out because, you know, this, that's their culture. You don't want them out of their culture, but you want them out of this pattern of child rearing, childbirth. All you do is childbirth. No, get an education, get a job. Go out there. Doesn't mean you don't want to have children, uh, but usually, if you have a woman who's educated and who's working, along with a man who's educated and working, they may have one, two, three kids. They're not going to have four, five, six children. And again, that's where we can see uh, the population uh, begin to decline, or at least that rate begin to come down. Uh, average age at marriage going to uh, affect birth and fertility rates. Right? You get you get married at thirty five years old. Probably not going to have that many kids. You get married at fifteen. <laughs> you're going to probably have a lot of kids because you have all that time. All right. So that's another thing uh, we need to look at in these underdeveloped countries uh, that ch children get married early, uh, obviously in the U.S., right? What's the average age of marriage now? Near 30, 30 years old. Uh, you know, I, I, I got married at 30. So it, it, it was later, much later than maybe our parents, maybe your grandparents uh, or these uh, people living in these in these underdeveloped countries. Uh, availability of reliable birth control methods. Again, this is all about education in the underdeveloped countries, they don't have reliable birth control. They don't understand it. So again, educating and, and giving uh, people uh, in these underdeveloped countries uh, the ability to, to have these things. And obviously, religious beliefs, traditions, and cultural norms are going to affect things. Um, again, I, I, I live in a in a Hasidic, a Jewish community in Rockland County, and their community, their religion, their religion believes that you should all, everyone should have four to six children to help to help promote the Jewish faith, to help to help bring the Jewish faith into into the next century, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part of their religious beliefs, and so that's what they do. So again, how do you? This is, this is the yin and the yang. How do you tell people who have religious beliefs, hey, listen, you can't have six children because we don't want the population growing. They say, well, look, I, I live in America because I want to be able to do what I want to do and I want to be able to practice my, my religion and my traditions and my cultures freely. We're going to have six kids. And again, this is, again, that, that yin and that yang uh, that we have to kind of think about the pros and the cons uh, as we go into this and begin to try to come up with uh, maybe laws or maybe, uh, again, programs, not necessarily laws, but probably programs uh, to try to help slow down uh, the population growth. Again, this is just a picture of, of a little guy, uh, most likely in, in some underdeveloped country, uh, working, right? He's carrying a brick. What is he? Probably seven, eight years old. Again, these are all the factors uh, that affect. All right, factors that affect death rates. So those were factors that affect birth rates. 
indicators of overall health of people in a country. So your life expectancy, your infant mortality rate, that's the number of babies out of every 1,000 who die before their first birthday. So these are indicators of the health of people in a country. If you have a high life expectancy and a low infant mortality rate like we have here in the U.S., that means most people in the country are pretty healthy. If vice versa, you have a low life expectancy and a high infant mortality rate like they do in, let's say, uh, Bangladesh, well, then obviously the health of the people in your country uh, is, is not that great. Factors that cause high infant mortality, insufficient food, poor nutrition, and infectious, uh, infectious diseases. And again, a lot of that, unfortunately, found in our underdeveloped countries. And that's another reason why people in underdeveloped countries have a lot of kids, because sometimes their kids don't make it to adulthood. So they feel that they have to compete having children so that some of them will make it to adulthood uh, because if you have a high infant mortality rate, then unfortunately a lot of your infants are dying uh, before they before they reach their their first uh, their first year of their first year. Okay, so this is kind of what we're looking at: infant mortality rate. Uh, and again, as we go from 1960 to 2050, luckily everywhere the infant mortality rate's going down. So again, that's good news. Obviously, it increases the population. But look, I don't want babies dying, okay? I don't think that we as humans want babies to die. I think we can use our brains and our technology to figure out how to slow down our population by allowing children to live. That's personally what I, what I want to do. Hopefully, uh, that's, what, that's what you want to do as well. So it's good that we see this chart going down. Uh, but again, this is your less developed countries. You'll notice that infant mortality rate much, much higher uh, than the green here, which are the more developed countries uh, like the United States. So that's something uh, that we have to help them with. And again, we need to help them with health care, uh, education, uh, nutrition, uh, and things like that. All right, moving along. Migration, this is going to be the last slide of, of this part of the lesson. Uh, so the movement of people into and out of a specific geographic area is called migration. Why do people migrate? Jobs and economic improvement, religious persecution or ethnic conflict, they got to get out, political oppression or war, and of course uh, you have environmental refugees. Uh, if the environment uh, goes bad, they have to migrate or uh, humans will have to migrate uh, to find uh, a better environment. All right, so that's the end of part one. We'll start off with part two. Uh, how does a population age structure affect its growth or decline? So more on that coming up. Stay tuned.